Chafe um, from AgriSci. So Cassie was previously employed uh, by Riv Plains and managed this project. Uh, and now with AgriSci, Cassie will be um, continue to support Riv Plains on an advisory role. So take it away, Cassie. Thank you, Jane. So just, um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending today. It's, um, it's such a nice day outside. It would be nice to be out there, but unless we can't. So just, um, just before we start going through the, the detail of the, of the project, just to flag that it's um, actually funded and supported by two different organisations through the SOAR CRC and, both the, and the Golden Broken CMA. So in some ways, this is quite unique in that this trial was initiated by the SOAR CRC as part of their research program into plant soil interactions. But Roof Plains decided to participate in this research as it also aligned well with local grower interest in alternative rotations and understanding the relative value of plant diversity. So Roof Plains also had a key role in choosing the rotations and treatments of interest. So it wasn't like we were just told what, what trials and treatments to run. Um, and that was done in conjunction with uh, looking at what was, bit, what was of interest in the region and what farmers were, were interested in trialling. So then also in discussion with the Golden Broken CMA, we realised that while the CMA was supporting a range of on-farm demo type trials, looking at different cover crop options, there were no replicated trials in the region from which they could quantify the value um, of changing these plant systems. So in effect, the role of Roof Plains in this and the presence of this long-term replicated site in this region brings together both the farmer perspective to the science-driven research from the soil CRC and the science basis to the farmer driven investigations through the Golden Broken CMA. So it, it kind of plays a really nice role in connecting a range of, um, a range of organisations. So the key with this site is we've set it up for the long term. Uh, we have funding for the next four years, but we've designed it as if it's a 10 year trial on the expectation and hope that we can continue to, to maintain some funding to keep it going. So it, it becomes a real asset for the farmers in the region. So that's the, that's the broader picture. Um, and just actually location of the site, um, for those who don't know, it's, um, it's hosted by the Lawless family and Nathan Lawless is speaking later this morning. Um, and it's on what's called Stinking Goat Corner, or Stinking, Stinking Goat Bend on the Yarrawonga Katamatite Road. So just keep an eye out for it um, as you're driving on that road. So Jane and Michelle have put together a bit of a video uh, going through the site and um, it's my first time talking to video, so we'll just see how we go and hope that it's of interest. So this is a drone shot from the site last year, um, which just shows the, where it sits in relation to, the, to everything else. Um, and just highlighting, what, as I mentioned, we've set it up for the long-term trial. So the design is such that we can overlay different treatments over time um, and potentially expand the number of different things that we're looking at. So to do that, uh, if I just walk through with my mouse, um, if we look at the rep one, which is closest to the ute, um, can you see my mouse? Yep, okay. So we've got a buffer strip on the edge and then we've got four strips here and those four strips are all one plot or one rep of a treatment. So I've done four runs for each uh, for each replicate in order to have that uh, space in, and time to be able to um, diversify the number of treatments that we're applying. So just running through uh, the setup for the, for the treatments, which is probably simplest doing it this way, is we have our control, which last year was just under wheat. Then we have the next four runs are field pea, uh, looking at if we were running a, a, a pulse for, for harvest. And the next four are a field pea that was brown manured. The next four is field pea and tillage radish that were brown manured. So looking at the relative value of, of peas um, for grain versus brown manuring and then the impact of plant mixes for that brown manuring value. Then the next four are what we call our peola treatment. So these were under wheat last year and this year they're under peas and canola together. The next four uh, wheat that was sown with uh, subclover underneath last year, what we call our intercropping treatment, 
which is looking at a short term, what the value of short term diversity in the system. So sowing sub clover with wheat and then terminating it in spring uh, before there was any uh, water competition. Then the next four, I think I've lost my place, but um, then we have our low diverse, low biomass cover crop, which was under wheat in 2019. And then over summer was under um, buckwheat and medic as kind of the Clayton's cover crop of a low biomass, but still having some green cover over the summer. Then the next four are our high biomass cover crop. So they were under wheat uh, in 2019 and then under a very uh, vigorous um, cover crop mix over summer of, of rape, tillage radish, sorghum and millet. And then there's the final four were an extra control that we put in because we weren't sure what we were going to do with it. But we decided to turn that into what we call a max diversity treatment. So it's under wheat in, um, in, the, in last autumn and then it went under the high biomass cover crop last year over summer and then into the uh, piola treatment this year. So you can see that we've got a range of different cropping um, options and looking at the role of different species interactions with that. So just to context the site this year, um, last year it was by itself and this year there's uh, two other trials next door. <coughs> As we pan around, the first trial is, is just a, another commercial piece of work. And then over on the right hand side is the trial that's run by Victorian DPI, which uh, Brennan will speak about later, which is also looking at some um, plant diversity options. So just panning across the site, I do apologise for the state of the ends of the, of the trial. The, um, it was supposed to be field day ready by today, not three weeks ago. So that's why the, um, the ends aren't as neat as they could be. So just looking at the um, one of the canola plus peas treatment, um, in this treatment, which is one of the controls, you can see the with the high stubble load we had last year, there was um, they struggled to sow through it this this um, season, which means the canola establishment wasn't as good as it could be. Um, and just looking across the site, the different um, different treatments, you can certainly see some difference in plant establishment and biomass through the trial, and particularly the uh, peas in canola treatment. Certainly the biomass is obviously a lot higher as you'd expect. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see how they actually come through at harvest. And the canola and peas will be desiccated and harvested together and then the seed will be separated post harvest so we can look at the relative yield of each of them. Um, again, seeing this, this was a um, one of the cover crop treatments over summer. And you can see that there's quite a bit of trash left after the crop was terminated in March and then it was sown in May. So not a lot of time for that residue to break down. So you can see there's large spaces between the reps as well. Uh, we've kept that large space in there for manoeuvrability of vehicles so that we can move around the site well between treatments. And just flagging, uh, this was our buckwheat and medic um, treatment, which was our sort of Clayton's cover crop. It was suffering a little bit at that point due to heat stress, but that was really a bit of a, uh, let, let's just have a play with something a bit different and see what, what that looks like as a mix. And then our multi-species mixture, uh, which certainly uh, had a bit of a slow start and then, and then got going um, pretty well later. Just panning through the, the um, different treatments, our control, um, which suffered a bit from emergence due to the amount of stubble. And then our poles from last year into our canola this year. Uh, this, this certainly did very well. You can see the um, next to the control there on the right hand side, the pulses, pole strip looks a lot better. But as you'd expect, um, there was no stubble issues to deal with because of the good breakdown of the, of the pulse stubble and certainly the amount of uh, moisture and nitrogen wasn't, wasn't limiting. So certainly you can see the lack of trash in those treatments. 
which is due to the um, the very e the ease with which the um, the pulses are broken down after after harvesting or, or brown manuring because of the high uh, nitrogen content in the plant. So this is that's one of the tillage radish tubers. Um, we saw a lot of those um, through the trial and certainly demonstrates the value of them as a as a soil buster in terms of the, the volume of soil that they can displace and what that means in terms of potentially opening up viables. So the piola treatment, um, the, certainly the, the canola plants are a lot more visible now than they were uh, when these photos were taken as the, as the flowers are starting to come through a lot more. So it will be interesting to see how they, how they perform. A key issue with this, um, with the piola stuff is, is around the nitrogen management, which is something that we need to continue to, to resolve. So then our canola are on to our um, low biomass cover crop. <clears throat> Certainly the emergence in that was, was a lot better than, um, than what it was in some of the other, some of the other treatments. And then with our high biomass, uh, sorghum, millet, rape and, and radish treatments, the, the amount of trash and residue left in that system was quite um, significant, which had a big impact on, on the establishment of the canola. And that final max diversity treatment, which is just basically putting everything in together and seeing if that the theory around increased diversity does hold over time. So just looking back. <coughs> nice, nice artistic shot by Jane. Um, and uh, yeah, that was just an overview of, of the site. And I think we're about, about there. So it's obviously dried out a lot since these photos were taken. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's what the site looks like. So I'll just um, hand back on to, on to Jane. Okay, great. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the general site? No, good. All right. Um, so now I'll hand over to Professor Terry Rose from Southern Cross Uni, who's the CRC project leader. So Terry will go through some results from last year and what we are starting to see this year. Thanks, Jane. Um, just kind of a quick check. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yep. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much. Welcome, everyone. Um, firstly, this project is supported by the Cooperative Research Centre for High Performance Soils, run out of Southern Cross University, um, and it's in conjunction with a range of other partners. It's a national project, but for this site, um, most of the work's been done by Shanaj Parvin, who I see is online here, uh, Mick Rose and Lucas Van Sweeten from New South Wales DPI, and Cassie and Jane from Riv Plains. So, as Cassie said, there's, there's quite a number of treatments in there, and, and we're sort of looking at a range of options to increase diversity. But given that we couldn't hold a field day and I've only got five minutes of fame here, I thought I might just focus on, on one of our um, prospective ways by which to increase diversity, which is summer cover cropping. So I wanna talk about um, some of our results and have a look at, at what some of it might mean. So as Cass mentioned, we've got two summer cover crops. So we have a fallow control, which is just our wheat fallow um, in, in a standard rotation. Then we have our low biomass buckwheat and medic cover crop. And then we've got the higher, um, higher mix, higher biomass mix, which has got radish and forage rape, which are both brassicas. And then you've got sorghum and millet, which are both grasses. So even though there's, there's a mix there, they're actually the same from the same families as if you have a wheat canola rotation. So there's, there's one thing about having mixed diversity, but one of the questions that we've always asked is, do, does that sort of mix actually assist us if we're actually putting in species that might carry over disease into the next crop. So that's part of the rationale for those treatments. So next question is, what do we actually want to measure? What do we want out of these summer crops? 
um, summer cover crops. So as you can see there, I've listed our key measurements that we took and one is the biomass produced by these mixes um, and the water they used, which is critical in our water limited environments for your next crop yields, whatever that might be, in our case canola. Um, we're also going to measure obviously the yield of the next crop and see what impact that had. We're going to look at soil carbon. Um, there's a lot of work in the literature that suggests cover crops can increase soil carbon. Most of that is from the Northern Hemisphere where they're growing you know, five to 10 tonne cover crops over winter where it's very wet and they can actually produce a lot of biomass. We're going to look at disease levels in autumn. So just using Predictor B. So do our cover crops have any impact on disease levels and what might be the consequences for our next crop? And finally, we want to look at soil health and soil function to see whether we're changing anything in the soil that might be um, beneficial. And it, obviously this is the first year of the trial, so we can look at what happened in this year. But we're also, as Cassie said, we're hoping to run this trial um, for the best part of a decade. And so even if we don't see something the first time we do it, we're hoping if we repeat these treatments over time, possibly something might pop out um, in the years to come. So there's plenty other of reported benefits of cover crops, but we focused on, on those measuring things that we think might be a benefit in our system. So as an example, in America or in Europe, one of the big reported benefits is reduced nitrate leaching. Now, the reason they get reduced nitrate leaching over there is because they're planting their cover crops into winter. The soils are very wet and it basically acts as a mop crop, goes down and picks up nitrate. We don't tend to get much nitrate leaching in our summers. One, because it doesn't rain very much and two, because it's really hot. And so your evaporation and evapotranspiration are very high. So we thought, okay, well, given the cost of measuring that and given that it's unlikely to be a benefit in our environment, we'll focus on things that we think help in our environment. So what were the key events? So we harvested last year's wheat um, in December. We sowed the cover crops in January on the 13th. And as you can see from the rainfall graph there, the main reason it was planted then, and this is always going to be the case with summer cover crops, is it's going to be tricky to know when to plant. You sow dry, hope for rain, you wait for rain and try and get it in. So we waited for rain. We got a rainfall event in mid-January and they were sowed upon that. So roughly an inch in a day and a bit more to follow up the next day. Um, and then you can see the rainfall from then on. So we grew them for eight weeks over February, March. There was a couple of little events and then a bit more towards mid-March. Um, we terminated the cover crops on the 23rd of March. So again, roughly eight weeks of growth. We wanted to give, um, give enough time after termination for any subsequent rainfall and fill the profile a bit. We didn't want to grow them, just keep growing them up to when we sowed um, the winter crop because we thought they, one, it might interfere with sowing, but also it might use too much water. We measured um, cover crop biomass and we looked at some soil parameters during the actual growth of the cover crop to see whether it had changed anything in the soil. We also sampled the soil again in April and then before sowing for soil function to see whether as those residues decompose, whether they change anything in the soil. Unfortunately, I don't have the results of those back yet. So the results I have are only for the soil underneath the actual cover crops. Uh, and then we sowed canola on 6th of May and we also took predictor B samples to look at disease. So what do we got here? On the right hand side is our cover crop biomass at termination after eight weeks. So as you can see on the left hand side is our biomass. So roughly the Medican buckwheat got about 600 kilograms, 0.6 of a tonne per hectare. And we've got about a tonne of biomass in, in the mix with the uh, brassicas and grasses. Now that's above ground biomass. You know, there's going to be probably at least half of that again in below ground in roots and probably what they exuded over the eight weeks. But again, you can see compared to some of the results you see from Europe and America, where they're talking five or 10 tonnes cover crops, we're unlikely to get that here. We just don't get the rainfall and it's too hot. We then asked, what did that biomass do to our soil profile in terms of water use? So on the left hand side, the top graph is the actual water use. So the millimetres of water at sowing. So we went and cored down at sowing to see what was left. Now the red bar is the low biomass cover crop. So that's your Medican buckwheat. And we got a 6% reduction in total soil water. And then where we had the high biomass, we got a 13% reduction in total soil water. So yeah, they grow biomass, but they are using some water. Uh, down below is 
a graph of, of the, um, the moisture down the profile so we can see where it was taken. And as you can see, if you go on the left-hand side of that, you can see 60 centimetre depth and you go in from there, that's where the big differences were. And so the blue bar is the fallow or the, or the blue line and you can see it's, it's further to the right. So it's around 0.35% um, percent moisture and then the red line at 60 centimetres has less moisture and then the green line, which is our sorghum, millet, radish and forage rate, it's used more water at depth. And so there's a bit of a shame of that is quite often it's that water at depth that's actually protected from evaporating and it might contribute to our, our grain yields in the next season. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to point out uh, on that graph and that is that if, if we get rainfall to, over, to overcome that, so it's one thing to dry the profile out a little bit, but the consequence of that probably depends on what rainfall we have this year. So if we get a dry year, maybe that little bit of moisture use at depth makes a difference. If we get a really wet year, which we have, maybe we get away with it and it has no effect. The other thing I'll point out is that the, the water use here basically reflects the biomass produced. So Sharnaj, the postdoc on the project, who's listening in here, she ran a trial at Wagga Wagga and actually looked at the rooting depth of a lot of these cover crops that we use. And they all push roots down to beyond 60 centimetres. So they're all going to go deep. And so the amount of water they actually suck out just tends to depend on their biomass. Okay, we had a look at some soil health indicators. Now I'm gonna give a bit of an explanation of some of these. As I mentioned earlier, these are from underneath the cover crops compared to the fallow. Um, we haven't actually looked at what happened as those cover crops decomposed. So the left-hand graph is, um, it, it shows some soil enzyme work that we did, which is some of the measurements you can move, use to measure soil health what these enzymes measure. And for example, there's one in the middle there on the left-hand graph called GLC, that stands for glucose. What it is, is if, if you feed the soil glucose, we measure the enzyme activity that basically says, right, our soil, how quickly can you break this down? So what's your, what's your ability to break down and, and turn over carbon? And so that's a pretty easy carbon source. You can also feed it some tougher carbon sources to break down. Um, the one on the far left, NAG, is a, is a nitrogen source, it's an amino acid with some nitrogen in it. And it says, so once again, right our soil, here's, here's a nitrogen organic compound, what's your capacity to break that down? And so rather than actually measuring what bugs are present in the soil, you can get it sequenced and have a look at which families are there, which species. But a lot of those, those families do the same job, which might be to break down nitrogen compounds. So what, what we look at instead is, if we give the soil a particular substrate, whether it be a, a phosphate source, a, a carbon source, what can you do? How quick can you break that down? Now, the, the three different colours are the fallow and the two different um, cover crops. And as you can see, we actually had very little difference in any of those um, measurements of soil health in terms of enzymes. So what that means is while the cover crops were actually growing, which was when we took these measurements, there's no real difference in that soil's performance in, in turning over nutrients. On the right, we've got some other measurements. We looked at total carbon and nitrogen in the soil and what I've called proteins in the soil, but this measure of extractable protein, it tries to extract what they call glomalins, which are the, the sort of fungal derived proteins that hold soil together in, in aggregates. Um, and and that it also sort of extracts humic compounds. So these are, these are the sort of good compounds that you want in your soil. So we wanted to check whether any of our cover crops are affecting that. And as you can see, once again, all the bars are pretty similar. So we didn't have any effect um, on those parameters in the cover crop stage. The question will be, and like I said, we've, we've got the samples, we just haven't processed them yet. What happens as those cover crops start to decompose in autumn? And then just prior to sowing, have we actually instigated some changes then that might then have an impact on our crop growth? And I'll have to get back to you with that next year's field day, be it virtual or not. So in conclusion, we can grow summer cover crops. Um, you can get them in on rainfall, possibly you could sow them dry. We're never going to get huge biomasses or it's unlikely unless we get a really wet summer. Um, so we, we sort of got, I've made a mistake there. I said 600 to 100 kilograms, that should be 600 to 1000 kilograms. So you can get up to a ton of above ground bio, biomass, but it does deplete soil water. The impact of that soil water depletion is going to depend on what happens at the start of the season and throughout. Now, given we've had a wet year, I guess my prediction so far would be we may not see a difference in yields, um, but who knows? 
We had no effect on any of the predictor B tests at sowing, and so far we haven't seen any effect on any of our soil health parameters. But like I said, that was during the cover crop phase. It'll be interesting to see what the next uh, measurements after they decompose um, show us. And finally, I'll put an open question there. That's what we thought were interesting measurements to take that might actually be of um, benefit to our systems. I'll be keen to know if any of you are trying cover crops or are interested, and what would you like to see measured? What are you hoping to get out of them? And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Terry. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat for you, Terry. Hang on, I'll stop my screen sharing. <laughs> I, can... I can't actually see. So how do you do a glucose test in the soil? Yep, so it doesn't actually test glucose. We actually add glucose to the soil and you measure the activity of, of enzymes in the soil. So you're basically trying to find out how quickly they can break it down. The technicalities of it, I wish we had some of the guys from DPI who were here, um, sorry, on our project who actually run it. It's quite a, it's quite a tricky little thing and you need some um, implements that can actually measure fluorescence. So you, um, that's how you, you put it on a plate reader and actually look at fluorescence from um, some of the compounds they put in, which reflects how quickly these bugs are turning over the glucose. Um, what we might do if you're interested and what I'd like to do is get the guys to put together a video that shows you all these soil health tests we do. What do they mean? Here's how we test it and how do you interpret them? So that's a, a fairly rudimentary explanation from myself, but hopefully we can get something online at some point that gives it a better explanation. But it's basically, we give it a substrate and in this case it was glucose and we said, righto, how quick can you break that down? What's your, what's your biological activity to deal with that? Okay, I might just hand over to Cassie to answer about the pulse in the summer cover crops. So the reason why we didn't put the pulse in with the summer, which is a really good question, is that because we were then following that up with um, a pulse in some of our treatments with the, the piola, is we didn't want to compromise the, um, the health of the disease status of the pulses that we're then going to go through to harvest. Um, and be a cash crop through having them over summer and then following through the system. But that's a really good question. Um, and if it's something that we need to, to look at at some point is the capacity for those summer cover, summer cover crops um, to have pulses in them. Um, but what that disease bridging is like moving into subsequent crops. So I'll just quickly add to that too, Jane, and it's a good question. And, and the, the fact is we're probably a bit behind the eight ball here in terms of research. There's so many questions as to what you might put in, um, whether to use mixes, whether to include different families or whatnot, and what's the impact, for example, like I said, if you're, if you're growing wheat, 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 fine, you might want to have, you know, brassicas, legumes, anything in your cover crop mix. What if you're going into canola? What's the implications of having a brassica over summer or vice versa, if you're going to go into wheat, What's, what's the implications of having a millet or a sorghum in there? And these are all the questions we need to start getting some information um, on. It's just a shame we haven't been doing it for the last 10 years to have a bit more info for you. So apologies for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cass, do you want to have a go at the next question from Rhiannon? I think Terry could probably um, add to this also, but I think... Um, Basically, we do expect that it will take time for any changes to come through, which is why we've set up as a long-term trial, not as just a, a, a one-hit wonder. Um, but part of this work and the research that's happening is around tracking um, over time to see what's the time frame of any difference and what's the magnitude of that difference over time. So that's a very good question. And, and there's, I guess there's two, there's, there's the short-term time factor and then there's the long-term time factor. So in the short term, as you say, that's why we, we sampled under the cover crop and then we sampled a few weeks later and a few weeks later and a few weeks later. And that's the data I haven't got processed yet because in the short term, you're exactly right. You're going to have what's under it then the cover crops are going to decompose. Well, if you get a bit of rainfall and it's warm enough, they'll decompose. So you're going to get a big flurry of activity in the soil. And that, that was basically what, what we were trying to work out is if your summer crop does decompose and you get a massive burst of activity in summer, but then that, depletes down again you know they, they use all the carbon they use it all they build up their population and then that slowly 
tapers back because they've run out of food. If by the time we get to sowing our crop in May, if the soil's gone back to the baseline standard, what's the, was there actually an impact of that? You know, if you just get a big burst and then it goes back, does that actually have any implications for the soil moving forward? So that's the short term time factor. Then there's the long term. So if we do this every year for the next 10 years, do we slowly shift populations or do we slowly shift our soil function in that way? Okay. Thank you. There's a couple more questions, but we might wait uh, for a little bit. Um, we'll just move along it. So we're running out of time. Um, so alongside this trial, as we said, there's um, another trial run by Agri Agriculture Victoria as part of the Victorian Grains Innovation Partnership. So I'll hand over to Brendan Christie from Agriculture Victoria to give a quick overview of this project. Okay, I assume you can hear me okay and that's fine. So thank you very much for giving, I've been given um, three minutes of fame, Terry, not, not five, and I'll, I'll endeavour to speak to, to, to time. And, and it's in the cropping to exploit rainfall for profit at Brower Mines, actually a site that, that is actually mirrored right across the state. So I've got a whole lot of colleagues here at Horsham and Hamilton and even in Melbourne because we're actually mirroring this right across the state. So you can see my work colleagues and things like that and moving right along one of the key things looking at Barrow Mind here is look using companion crop in the cropping and we're trying to to use crop mixtures in a way that 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 synergy to actually fight fight for resources and actually lead to greater sort of yield. So by having sort of companion crops in the sort of mixture, two different crops, the fight for sunlight and things like that we're hoping to actually cause the plants to grow more and hence to over yield. And the same below sort of systems. Some, some of the companions we've chosen have got different sort of root systems and what we're trying to do is cause that competition below sort of ground for water and sort of nutrients and to actually exploit more resources by forcing them down deeper to actually capture more of that end and, and fix um, end and water to actually put it through the sort of grain. And that is essentially the, um, the mix what we do and what we've got at, at Barrow Mine, it was sown on the 29th of May, are four companion sort of mixes. They've actually done for a whole range of sort of structural sort of elements. But we've got the pea and canola um, in that sort of mix. And we've actually mixed them in, in different sort of proportions where in one side, the, the peas themselves that dominate 75% pea and a little bit of canola or a lot more canola, a little bit of field pea. We've also got mixes around canola and, and faber. We've got mixes around faber and sort of wheat and, and barley and canola. And the barley canola was actually not just for competition, but also see if we can increase the quality of barley by having the canola use up the sort of end. So here's actually sites. And as I said, I've just got three minutes. So it's really just saying, hey, we're here and the results will be come. But this site here at um, Barrow Mines, one of sort of three sites in Northeast Victoria, um, the Kenny Amber and Rubigan site had the, um, got so about three weeks sort of earlier. So we're a bit more sort of advanced, although Burrow Mines had more rain to Kenny Ambo. Um, the sites are actually here, the, the mixes are there, there's a lot more data. The sheets will be sent out by Jane after. So if you're interested in there and you want to get a lot more information, a bit more detail, contact um, me on that, um, off that sort of flyer and I could actually run you through an endless amount of pictures of, of any of those sites and where we're at and there's things. And I'd also like to acknowledge our um, farmer reference group. I know Aaron, Aaron Geese and, and Ed are online here at the moment. We're actually lucky in this idea that we've got a farmer reference group actually overseeing the site and putting us on a long, straight and narrow. And I'll save the Thanks. time. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I think it just shows the importance having these two trials side by side. Um, and we couldn't do it without the cooperation of the uh, landholder. So, on board, I have Nathan Lawless. Um, just like to say a huge thanks to the Lawless family. Um, and just ask Nathan a couple of questions. Oh, we can see you now, Nathan. Yeah, I figured it out. <laughs> I had a and a haircut for the occasion. I couldn't get my camera going. I was shattered. <laughs> <laughs> So Nathan, uh, yeah, firstly, thank you. Um, but also, I guess we just wanted to have a quick chat about um, what do you see as the benefits of having a trial site like this in the region? Um, well, I think it's a perfect fit for some of the things we've been doing. Um, I think we've sort of been doing stubble retention in hotel for 
um, quite a few years and, and I think we've sort of hit a bit of a flat spot and we're looking for the next step and um, and I think uh, certainly uh, yeah, crops and, and companion crops and uh, I think you're probably going to take us to the next level. Um, yeah, so having uh, you guys come on board last year and come to us with something we're already pretty interested in, um, yeah, we're wrapped to have it on our side. Okay, good. Um, so obviously you're pretty familiar with some of the treatments. Is there any of the treatments that you've seen so far that you're a bit excited about or...? Um, we, we noticed last year in, well, it was an extremely dry year, how well the radishes grew and, um, and even the peas. And, um, yeah, so it was something we were, we were looking at doing with some silage. We cut wheat silage last year and, um, and after seeing how well, yeah, the, the radish and peas grew, we've, we've got some triticale peas, radish growing together and, and barley peas and radish and, um, We've started cutting them this week and um, look, they're cutting between 25 and 30 tonne to the hectare, sort of yeah, wet wet, and, and sort of seven to nine tonne dry matter. And um, and I think the uh, the radishes, well, that we thought they may have taken away from biomass, but we're, we're pretty confident they've added to it. And um, and the peas, they struggle for sunlight, but um, but I think they've, they've added to the mix as well. So... Um, yeah, so seeing some of the things that you guys did on small, small scale in Barramon in in, uh, in the semi desert environment, we've uh, we've scaled them up into something that yeah we've been pretty happy with. Well, that's good. Um, so I guess does anyone else have any questions for Nathan um, at this point of time? We're kind of heading now into question time. Um, One thing we noticed where we, we grew some covers last year, uh, we sowed about uh, 200 hectares for a neighbour that, um, yeah, that wasn't real successful and, and we, we had about uh, 40 hectares in of our own. Um, they grew quite well even on that. You see there was only one spike in the rain, rainfall graph for the summer, but we had sunflowers and, and millet and corn and that sort of thing, sort of, yeah, four or five or four foot tall and sunflowers, um, sort of the size of a dinner plate. And, um, and some of the things that they did, uh, we were wrapped with. Um, we've noticed this year that the wheat on, on those, on some of those areas, the biomass is a little bit less, um, even though we've probably had a perfect winter. Um, and we're just, uh, we're just hoping that we can sort of, learn something from it. I think we, the plan was to go a short season barley after the cover crop, but um, with having a bit more moisture and, uh, and the barley job falling away, we, we switched over to wheat. And um, yeah, so it'd be just interesting to learn how much moisture we have taken or whether we've accessed moisture that, that we wouldn't have normally accessed. But I guess that's what we're trying to do it over a few years to figure some of those things out. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I might hand over to Terry to answer the question from uh, Josh regarding uh, the sowing within seven days of harvest, like, like in a US model. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's possible. It probably just comes down to whether or not it actually germinates. It just comes down to moisture. If we've got... Um, I presume that's what you're talking about, sowing the cover crop after harvesting your your main crop. Is that as opposed to sowing, as opposed to terminating your cover crop and immediately sowing your cash crop? What's, can I just get some clarification, Josh? Yeah, so a lot of the stuff that you see, I mean, they're talking, they've got air seeders rolling basically almost in the paddock while the head is harvesting wheat. Yeah, right. Crop. So um, putting your cover crop in immediately after harvest. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep, so again, it all comes down to moisture. So I've heard, I've heard of people, I've seen on, on, on Twitter, um, people doing it, and then it just depends on when it rains as to whether um, they, are, to when they emerge, and then you can get the odd little bit of rain that tickles them up, but not enough, so it sort of partially germinates them and you lose half of them, whereas they're, they're going because they're going into their winter. It's usually pretty wet, or it's going to get wet, and so 
the whole moisture thing just isn't such a problem for them. Yeah, um, yeah. And I suppose in some respects too, a lot of their reason for doing it is actually hold snow on the paddock to sort of increase their moisture. To retain. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I guess here's, here's a question for us then, for you guys, because we, we debated this as, okay, when should we be trying to put this out? Now, as a grower, is it, is it, um, is it something you would consider while trying to get your harvest off and sort of coming into the holiday season to want to get back out there and do it? Or would you prefer to say, okay, well, let's just focus on that, have a gap or have a bit of buffer and then so later, or is no, not really a consideration? I know. A year like this year, we could still be harvesting in January. <laughs> yeah. yeah if, if we get a favourable spring. Um, so, yeah, I suppose last year I could have been sowing mid-December. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I suppose the year-by-year thing. Um, and I suppose it's, yeah, it depends on of what's going to work operationally and what's going to be, what's going to give the results at the end of the day. Because, I mean, we, we wondered that if, if we did get, you know, rain pretty soon after harvest, we debated about, okay, would we go in and sow it? Is that something that you guys would likely do? Or is it something where you'd say, all right, I've just managed to get harvest, give me a few weeks off, take Christmas off and look at it again in January. So we, we basically don't, what we, what we want to do is stuff that's of use rather than us going and doing it and having you guys say, well, we wouldn't do that. So the more info, yeah, the more feedback you can give us as to what you may and may not do, the yeah, the we can... Find you, there's plenty of families to probably spend a fair bit of January when they can at the beach. Yeah, and that so. was that was basically a consideration. We thought, we yeah, if that is, you know, if there's a lot of families who are like, well, we don't really feel like going and doing a heap more work after harvest, we want to get away. Well, we yeah. thought, right, well, let's look at what would happen if that was the scenario, when you might get back on later in January, what happens then? Yeah. yeah. But I guess it wouldn't hurt us to, to look at both and then you can make it, yeah. Yeah, oh, just out of interest. I know the, some of the information was they seemed to think within seven days is when they were getting their best germination. Um, now, what the reason was for that, I, I don't know. But And no one said yeah. it specifically because of X, Y, Z. But, yeah, that's just... What what you're heat, so a lot of it, too, is remember they're going into very cold. So the earlier they can get theirs in, they've still got some heat left to get stuff up and going. Yeah. Because um, I know some of them are even looking... So when they grow corn... A lot of them are looking at actually into sowing into the corn so that it's already up and just underneath the corn ready to roll. As soon as the corn's off, they don't have to sow it. It's actually underneath it already and boom, up she comes. And it just comes back to that that getting getting a few days or weeks of, of when it's actually above zero to actually get some growth. Yep. Yeah. Nathan, do you have any comments about the timing of the cover crop? Um, we're looking at, well, we've got the silage off now, uh, we're, we're halfway through it, we're thinking that um, as soon as we can get a good kill um, of some of the ryegrass and maybe a double knock, um, we'll start sowing. Um, and we're thinking, well, we'd like to have it in by the end of this month. Um, and then I'm planning on sort of terminating, um, yeah, in January sort of thing, give us a bit of chance for, to build up a bit of moisture, but we've put a bit of ground cover back on the, on the paddock. So, yeah, and I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> That's farming, isn't it? <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Okay, good. Um, all right, Terry, another one for you. Uh, quorum sensing? Yeah, the brief answer is I, I have no idea how to measure that. Um, but I guess what, we, what we're trying to pick up in our tests, rather than actually looking at the microbes present, like whether you've got 50,000 of X and 65,000 of Y and, oh, that shifted by this and that, um, those populations shift very easily. Um, they'll, they'll shift with no, no matter what activity you do, but rains, they'll shift. Though they're very dynamic microbial populations and, and they'll, they'll mould with whatever you do. So I guess what we're trying to pick up is, okay, let's say some do go down by, you know, 10 million of them dropped off and another 5 million of them came up. What, what does it actually do in terms of your soil's function, in terms of its performance? What are the jobs that your soil needs to do? Um, you know, it needs to be able to turn over nutrients. Um, you want it to, to hold together aggregates and all these sorts of functions that we want out of our soil. So that's why we've chosen to actually focus on those rather than trying to measure specifics of which microbes might be present and what's doing what. 
Um, but as for actually measuring quorum sensing, no, I haven't given it that much thought, sorry. Okay, no worries. All right, well, um, might go to some final questions because uh, we've pretty much run over our half hour as we knew we would. Um, <laughs> but there doesn't seem to, if anyone else has got a question, unmute now and otherwise, might just say thank you to everyone uh, for being present this morning. And um, we really appreciate all the questioning. Appreciate, thank you, Terry, Cassie and Nathan um, for your presentations. And I hope everyone got um, a bit of an idea about what's at the site, what we're trying to achieve, um, and what not only our site, but the Agriculture Victoria site as well. Um, as I said, this will be available online um, for anyone that has missed it. Um, and with a bit of luck, next year, we might be able to have a field day in person at the site. Um, so, Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day and good luck for those with harvest. And we'll see you later. Thanks, Jane.